This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another one of our speaker series. Uh, today is the 21st of May, and we're here with Sarath Krishnaswamy, who currently works as Vice President for Automation at Smith & Nephew. Smith & Nephew is a leading global medical technology company where he's responsible for robotics and automation projects in manufacturing centers worldwide. After completing his degree in engineering at MIT, he held a number of positions as a technology executive at a startup making robotic microbiology systems, as well as he worked for Amazon Robotics, leading the next generation of robotic system development, and Johnson & Johnson, where he led the development in autonomous digital surgery. In his free time, he just so happened to have been a Cub Master, a Scout Master, and a Council Officer on the Executive Board. So without any further ado, ladies and gentlemen, our good friend, Sarath, how are you today? I'm great, Chuck. How are you doing? Thank you so much for Thanks. having me. Thanks. No, this is great. We appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm a pretty informal guy. Uh, what I thought I'd do, uh, I, I love taking questions and, and uh, talking about kind of the what, what, what my experiences have been. Um, what I thought I'd do is just pop up a presentation really quick so that people could um, uh, see a little bit of pictures from my career. Uh, and then um, I can take questions on that or, or on anything else. It's kind of part of it too. I, I uh, one of the things I'll note is, um, you know, I've, I've held a lot of leadership positions, but I actually have learned the most about leadership by being uh, by being a scoutmaster. So uh, I'm really happy to be able to, to get back with this. I'm gonna right. shrink this so I can see my slides, and y'all can tell me if um, these advance, okay? So. Um, and these are silly picture slides, right? Just to give folks an idea of kind of things I've seen over the years, and and that may um, help figure out what we, you know, what what questions you have. Um, the company I work for right now, Smith and Nephew, uh, it's a British company. Um, although mostly, actually, it has facilities kind of in the United States, um, China, and Costa Rica. Um, and we make medical devices. And medical devices are, are all sorts of different types of things. Um, you can see a bunch that Smith and Nephew makes here. Can you all see my mouse if I move that around? Yes, I can see it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So um, uh, some of these can be rather simple, right? Uh, ju just um, uh, uh, grippers or little cutters, the uh, plates that are used in trauma if you break a bone uh, and need a plate inserted. Uh, and some of these are just, you know, these are all pieces of metal with screw screw fittings, right? But in different shapes, you know, depending on which bone you broke. Um, for If you know someone who had shoulder surgery, particularly in sports medicine, a lot of screws and inserts and the devices that the doctor actually uses to place them into your body uh, and, and affix them to, you know, your shoulder if you're repairing a ligament or um, uh, an ACL repair. And then kind of more complex, you know, these things up here, this is a hip replacement um, or the ball, the ball part uh, of a hip replacement. Uh, these are knees, artificial knees. Um, and then even some robotics. Um, the, the Smith and Nephew has uh, a robotically controlled uh, knee surgery system, and that has a cutter on, an on the end. There's a huge camera that looks at where the surgeon's holding the, um, the device. And that kind of guides the surgeon to, to make the cuts when doing a knee replacement exactly where they have to be. So um, it can go from really simple bits of metal to really complicated instruments, what we do. And what I do uh, and my team is actually uh, make, those, make those products and make them better and faster. And, and for me, this is a really new thing. I took this job about six months ago, and it's the first time in my career that I've been on the manufacturing side rather than on the product development side. So all of my career, has really been in um, developing new products. And now for, for uh, when I took this job, it was really figuring out how to make products um, more efficiently. And so our team really looks at ways to implement robotics, uh, machine vision, sensing, and data management to, to figure out how we're making things and to improve the process. So here on the left, we've got a huge, this is a huge uh, vat full of um, uh, polishing material. Um, those knees you saw and hips have to be polished to a really good finish and it takes a while and here we've got a couple of robots kind of dunking um, those parts into this polishing material to try and get them finished up well. Um, this is a robotic sample handling system that is used to, to feed um, parts into a lathe to, to turn them in, you know, so you've got billets of metal that are getting turned into um, uh, parts. Up here on the top right, a machine vision system, um, and you can look, what it's looking at is the detailed surface finish of a part and try and applying a fake color to it so that we can get a sense of how 
porous um, that finish is and how useful it is. And then we'll even do really large systems. So here's one that one of my team is working on right now. You can see the person in there for scale, and that's a, an automatic uh, tubing cutter. So it, it's creating tubing assemblies and cutting and winding them um, for packaging and cutting them to size. And so that's something we're just starting and um, that'll probably take a, a year uh, actually to get in place. Um, and interrupt me, uh, Chuck, if you have questions uh, on the way, but I'll just blip through some pictures and then you got, you know, we can talk about uh, it's stuff. doing great. Um, so what I've been, you know, how did I get here? Um, I'm from Hudson, Massachusetts. I pretty much have lived in Massachusetts my entire life um, and, and mostly kind of Metro West, uh, though I live in Dunstable now up, up near Nashua. Uh, I was a scout. I, I, I was in Troop 1 Hudson um, and only made it up to first class. It was hard to get merit badges back then uh, unless you went to camp and, and we couldn't afford to go to camp. Um, and uh, and they didn't have merit badge counselors. So and I, I grew up, uh, I was really afraid to talk to people in my in my early years. And um, thank goodness that, that I changed that. I went to Hudson High School uh, and and I had a, a pretty strong math and science background and I was in math league. So I was, you know, one of those guys. Um, but actually, a uh, really great English program there too. And I think that most of what I've done in my career, I would not have been able to do unless I could could speak and communicate well. Um, and, and that's just been just as important as the math, frankly. Um, I have two degrees from MIT. My undergraduate uh, degree and my graduate degree are both in mechanical engineering. Um, I was in the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, which is now called CSAIL, uh, and it's where all the robotics and uh, AI work happens. Um, at the time I was there, um, let me see, in the ba I was on the ninth floor of the AI lab, and that was those were the robotics labs, and uh, the next lab over was Rodney Brooks's lab, where one of his students, Colin Angle, um, was doing uh, insect robots and automation, and um, Colin always used to talk about founding his own company, and he founded it with with Rod and uh, Helen Grenier, and that was called iRobot. Um, so they're doing pretty good. Uh, and down in the basement of the AI lab at the time was uh, Mark Raber, and he was doing legged locomotion, and he ended up founding Boston Dynamics. And you've seen their <laughs> kind of scary looking robots, uh, their dogs right. and things like that. So it was it was a cool time to come out of that lab. Uh, and then I, I was interning uh, while I was in school, and then my first job out of school was at this company called Automatics, and they built these big industrial robots, um, but really turned into a machine vision company. Um, and so I spent my my first time out of school really doing vision guided robotics, right? And which was very new back then. Like, how do you see an object in a camera, figure out where it is, and then get the robot to to go there? Right. Um, I, I left that company and I went to Abbott Labs, which was a med device company. I'm not going to talk too much about that, but that's where I first became a director of engineering and, and learned to hire and, and evaluate people and organize. Uh, I left Abbott uh, and joined a startup called Rapid Microbiosystems. And you can see kind of the big product here. The, the product was really this huge system to look at uh, these custom Petri dishes we made and look for growing bacteria. And, and the customers were... Um, pharmaceutical companies and uh, uh, and device companies that had to test their product to make sure it wasn't contaminated. And in fact, one of our la the la last applications I worked on before I left was actually looking at um, making a, a variant of this dish uh, to fix vaccines. Go ahead. Nope. Oh, no. Take that. Yeah. Thought I saw someone. So um, it was a cool technology. We actually designed uh, a pair of robotic incubators that kind of sat inside the machine, one on top of the other. Um, and you could load in samples and we shined this super bright blue light on them. Um, and, the, and anything living will fluoresce under blue light. Um, and so it, it emits in the green very weakly and we would capture that image and we could see these micro colonies growing up into bacterial colonies if there was anything in the product. So it was this combination of robotics and vision um, and automation uh, and software all in one. And that, and for me, that was kind of neat because it was my first time, you know, I, I was a VP and an officer of the company. And so, you know, I was the first engineer hired and I had to build up the team from scratch, um, but also pitch the product. Um, you know, when you're in a startup, you're, you're looking for funding. And a lot of what you do is trying to tell people about your, uh, your application and why it's so great. Um, and we ended up being funded, you know, the lead investor was Kleiner Perkins, Kleiner Perkins, Cofield and Byers. 
probably one of the oldest and most respected firms in the United States, and they made their money on Amazon and Google. We were not an Amazon or Google, sadly. But, you know, it was kind of fun to hang out with them and and see some of the names. Um, left that for Amazon Robotics. Uh, Amazon Robotics is um, north of uh, north of the, the city. Um, pretty neat place. And my, my job there was to lead a new team called Advanced Robotics. And the idea was Amazon already had these little orange robots there um, that were Amazon Robotics that move, move product around and, and human workers pick product off of the shelves when you order it. We were trying to figure out um, how to use robots to pick and pick up and put down anything you could find in an Amazon facility, which is everything in the world, right? So how do you design a robotic gripper to um, pick up you know, a champagne glass or a wedding dress or a barbell all at the same time. Um, pretty neat, pretty pretty high tech uh, stuff. And I, I just had super, super bright uh, folks um, on that team. Uh, and we did pretty well. We, we, we actually got enough attention that Jeff Bezos came out. This is this picture on the top left. This was his first trip to, to the Boston area in, I guess they said seven or eight or nine years. Uh, and wow. it was really to see what we were doing. Um, and then he came back a year later, this is down there with, with the board of Amazon um, for a, a larger tour. Uh, so it was, it was pretty cool to, to, um, to talk to him and get some of his insights about, um, about the robotics actually, but also just Amazon. I think he has a lot of, he's a pretty intense dude and uh, has a lot of strong thoughts on leadership. And I, I thought that that was really neat to have that experience. Um, down here, I also, kind of the other thing I really loved about that was um, we had this thing called an Amazon picking challenge where we asked universities to come up with ways to pick um, to pick product, right? And here's this this is the, the one of the winners from one of the years I, I was judging it um, in Germany. And this this is uh, I think it was the University of Delft in the Netherlands. And they had you can they had this huge suction uh, vacuum cleaner hose and a, and a custom robot they built. So that was kind of neat. Um, then my the job I had before this one was a Johnson and Johnson. Uh, and they, that was a very short job. It didn't really work out too well. Um, but my, my, uh, the time I spent there, the goal was to really put together uh, a team for digital surgery. And so here, this is the idea of can you put together, it's more than just robotic surgery now. It's really combining robotics and imaging and, um, and, and hyper advanced imaging and also information displays to try to make it easier for the surgeon to do uh, what she wants in when she's doing an operation, right? And, and the other part of that is you can, use, you can use data like phone applications or, or sensors to, to actually get before and after information so that you're really trying to understand how to, um, how to do surgery that, uh, that's tailored to you, right? And so all of a sudden, surgery, robotics and technology are making surgery and, and allowing um, the, the surgical companies to really talk more to patients instead of to doctors, which is great. The closer you are to the customer, the better and to really tailor medicine for, for the specific patient. So, you know, um, one example I used to give is everyone has, um, you know, if you're doing a knee replacement, everyone's knees are a little bit different and your knees are not perfectly lined up, right? They're, they're you know, however you, you, you grew up, you might be tilted in a little, be a little bow-legged, you might be, you know, whatever, but they're not perfectly straight. And, um, and when you have surgery, you, you can get your, you know, artificial knee to be perfectly straight, but that's not super useful if your other leg isn't, right? It actually can be, can be <laughs> um, the goal of the surgery is not to make you perfect. It's to make you like you were before, right? Whatever that was, because all of your muscles have developed to support what you were before. So uh, all of the sensing actually allows the surgeon to on the fly, make sure that she's doing surgery that actually sets you up like you were before, right? So you're gonna see just much better outcomes um, coming out of that. So that's kind of my career. I, I would love to, to chat, I'm happy to chat about kind of any chunk of that. Um, I threw a couple of my random observations in here uh, and I'll, I'll put them up and then kind of vanish away from them. Um, but uh, I'm happy to talk to any of these or happy to just take questions from the audience or, or from you, Chuck, if you got them. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, the first one on your list right there. So um, that's like a great piece of advice, I think, for any anybody, whether a scout or anybody in the audience or anybody in ger general, uh, being 
how it's important to be very curious. Could you expand upon that? Like how did being curious and asking questions work out for you? So, um, it, 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 so I, I appreciate that. I, I think that for me, it was always, uh, and it, it, it's hard to do that because I was, I was kind of shy um, coming in. But what I found was um, if I didn't understand something, it was, it was usually okay. You kind of come in when you, particularly when you come in as a new engineer, right? Or if you're a new person in somewhere, you think, oh gosh, everyone should think I'm really smart. And, and you don't ask those questions. When I started as a new engineer, um, you know, I'd done robotics at, at MIT, but um, but doing it in a company is is really different. And trying to understand kind of, well, hey, why do we, why are we doing it this way? Um, and, and not making assumptions. Uh, when I when I first started, I really had to do a lot of asking of the older engineers to show me how they did their work, right? And so it wasn't that I didn't know kind of the fundamental science, but I didn't really know how to turn that into a real thing. Right. And so just by sitting with people and asking stupid questions about, well, why did you make that drawing like this? Right. Or um, uh, and, and then I find that it, it, it even now as an, as an executive, when I'm sitting in on a design review, I mean, people get a little bit more worried when I ask questions. But actually, it's really important to me to ask even kind of the dumb ones. And I think part of it is because um, it's really hard to make decisions if you don't, particularly in engineering, if you don't understand some of the, the underlying science. And I'm a mechanical engineer, but the products that my team, um, my teams have made involve biology, involve um, uh, computer software, which I'm not super good at. And so I, I need to ask those questions in order to make decisions. And I find actually also that by asking them, and sometimes they are silly, but but you know, um, now now that I ask them, it kind of opens up the floor for other engineers in the group to to ask questions too. Great. We had a, another follow up question. Almost, could you tie the whole being curious or asking questions? Um, how does how does that help you with learning, and how does that translate into trying and failing? And what do you get out of that? Sure. Um, I think failing is desperately important, but I'll actually hit that. So the, the, the being curious and asking questions, I think is because um, the, the, when people show you information in a presentation or they show you a drawing, an engineering drawing or something like that, we all really learn differently. And, and it's not really learning unless that, that inter, the data that they show you gets into your brain and turns into information, right? And you're probably the, the only person who knows how to do that for you. Right. And so by asking questions, you tend to frame you tend to frame things you're looking at in a way such that the answer can get into your brain. Right. So I, I think I, I actually think asking questions is probably the easiest way to learn rather than having something kind of sh shoved at you. Um, failing. I'm really a huge fan of failure, a huge fan. And I get every you know, I must have interviewed. I don't know certainly hundreds and, and maybe a thousand uh, engineers over the course of my life. And um, and I get kind of depressing in them because I really want to hear about failures, right? I, I, and, and, and that's what I love about scouting too, right? We're one of the, one of the great, um, one of the greatest things about scouting is it's a safe space to fail, right? And, and nothing teaches you like that. I, I find that you can have tons and tons and tons of successes, um, but, but you might've just been lucky. Right? When you fail and then look at a failure and incorporate it and move on from it, you've actually shown that you've learned something. Yeah, my scoutmaster used to always say that mistakes are teachers, and he yeah. would always just sit back and, and watch us watch us fail. Yeah, absolutely. I, I so great. one of my um, standard interview questions: tell me about tell me about one of your worst failures, right? And and I'll talk about mine, right? I, I've made a couple yeah. of really howler ones. <laughs> yeah. Well, that sounds great. Thanks. <laughs> What uh? What's your worst failure? Or or oh, you know I'm yeah. Sorry. And then how did you overcome? So, yeah. um, the one I I talk about a lot is when I just became a director of engineering um at Abbott. So my this I was my first director role was a department of about a hundred people, and uh, we made glucose meters for which measure your blood. If you have diabetes, you'd have to sample your blood, right? And uh, they had an error message, error one o five, and our meters in the field was like pop this error, error 105, and freeze. And that's that stock for two reasons. One, the freeze, so people couldn't use their meters anymore. But two, a good glucose number is about 100 to 120 or so. So it was a stupid error message too, because you got a number that was a really good number, right? And actually what it meant was the meter was broken. 
And uh, I had my engineering teams working on it and they, you know, my software team said, oh, we found out, you know, Sarah, we know what it is. When they push the button too fast, it jams the meter and it throws this error, see? And, the, and they, they were able to do it. And, and my hardware team was saying, I don't think that that's true, uh, that that's really what's happening. But, but, you know, we pushed it out, said, oh, the software people wrote a fix to sort of debounce the button and the error still kept happening. Right. And it really was a problem in the chip in the meter. And what that what that really taught me was th when you're trying to solve a problem or trying to fix a bug. Right. It doesn't count to fix. You have to actually actually find out the reason the bug is happening, not fix something that looks like it. <laughs> right. You know, just because you found another way to do it doesn't mean that you actually found the right thing. Yeah, that's great. On the opposite end, what is your greatest accomplishment so far? Or anything really spectacular that always I sticks think, out? As um, great. Yeah, I, so I'll give you two categories of that, I think, right? Uh -huh. I, um, on a personal level, I think one of the coolest things was being able to, to present to Jeff Bezos, right? To spend time um, uh, with someone, you know, with kind of a luminary in, in, uh, of the planet and uh, <laughs> interact a little bit and and uh and you know the richest human being on planet earth i think right now which was sort of neat um that that second call the second time we visited we called it the the three comma project because we were entertaining someone whose income had three commas you needed three commas to <laughs> um but but really actually what i what i really get the most enjoyment from now or, or my biggest accomplishments i think are finding um engineers that i hired uh or trained or, or managers that i hired or trained who are now becoming directors or vps somewhere else and and doing things that i could not have even thought about right i think that that's actually i i get probably the most satisfaction from that so i have another question too and um you mentioned it right at the beginning and then it's also in this final slide here but you you said along the lines of, you know, one of the greatest leadership learnings that you've had has been through being a leader in scouting, being a scoutmaster. Now, is that because the people who you hire are all like 10 year old, 11 year old kids and they're <laughs> learning new things? Or is that because of like maybe the patrol method or how like a structure is set up? How, so, how, how do you mean? Yeah, I think, um, I think part of it is because when we, when uh, as an adult leader in scouting, um, you really have to think hard about letting the scout develop on their own and and fail on their own and and retry and being um being coaching and and really you know all of this con this now modern concept of servant leadership right that's sort of how we're supposed to operate in scouting and and, and when you and so thing number one is all of the coaching and teaching and, and patience that that generates um i found i i took that to work rather than taking my work leadership to scouting, right? And I think the other part of it is that um, uh, scouts scouts teach you, and they teach you by teaching them, right? So even having to teach ILST, right, or the leadership training for scouting, um, and talk about leadership, and it kind of forces you to think about it. So Amazon has these funky leadership principles; they're awesome, right? Um, but actually trying to teach that to a bunch of 10, 11, 12 year olds really makes you think a lot more about what it means to be a leader. And I, I think that, um, it, as I said, I, I've gotten, I've been to all sorts of corporate leadership development classes and you know done the Amazon leadership principle thing and talked to Bezos about them um, and you know talked to the CEO of J&J &J as well. Um, but honestly, being a scoutmaster has probably been the best for me as a lead, uh, in terms of training. You mentioned how uh, right now you're on the manufacturing side and that was kind of your first time. Do you miss the other end of the process or is it uh, a stepping stone in some sort? Or yeah, I, I would say um, I do miss it. It's, it's manufacturing is new to me. Um, it's it's a different, it's sort of different language. It, it, it's a little weird because it's, it's like karma, right? Because um, for all this time I've been building products and then we get them to manufacturing and we're like, well, why can't you build this guys, right? You know, and, and you know, why is it so hard? We built it once, you can't build 10 million of them. And um, and now you know, I'm on the other side, trying to figure out how to, why why didn't you guys make it like this, right? Um, so to, th for me, it was a way to stay in robotics. I, after I left J&J, &J, you know, there's a period where I can't really do uh, R&D from a competitive perspective. Um, and so, uh, but I still wanted to be in robotics and sensing. And, and part of it is also, um, 
you really, I found it's really important to put yourself in situations where you're a little scared, right? Like, because I find if I don't do that, I get lazy. And so by doing this and by sitting on the manufacturing side of the aisle and learning a lot more about the cost sensitivity and the process sensitivity, um, I think it'll make me a better R&D leader, right? And so, you know, even though I really don't want to be working for too, too much longer, um, I think that this is a good way to sort of round out the portfolio. Is there a part to the research and development section or creation that is more difficult? And if so, why? You mean a part of the process? Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, it's going to be a little bit weird. So one of the Amazon leadership principles is invent and simplify. And, uh, and it says, right, this is this constant process of inventing and then simplifying and inventing and simplifying. And I think the simplify part is hard. It's hard to, you know, when you're building a thing for the first time, that rapid micro product, right? The first one we built, you, you, you really think you know what you're doing, but, you, you, but until you have it built and put it in front of a customer and they barf all over it, right? Or, um, or you realize, oh, I made this mistake, you, you know, you, it's really the second time that, that you kind of get the product right, um, hopefully. And it's very hard to step away from your baby, that first, that first gen, and, and say, no, this really stinks. Like, we got this, you know, you, you know you're kind of criticizing your own kid, right? Like, this, doesn't, this isn't right. We've got the size wrong in here. Uh, and tear it apart and do the next thing. And you have to force yourself to do that. You have to force yourself to be critical of the stuff you've done. Um, in order to make in order to get better right all right um let's see um do you have any any advice for anybody who might want to follow in your career path i know that you you know you went to mit and you got two degrees uh in the in the same field but um was there any other training or did it go deep into apprenticeship at all or or what advice would you give to some people who would want to go so, in that field yeah a couple things um uh, I don't necessarily think um, that, that university not, that I certainly, you know, for engineering, you're probably going to college, right? It's hard to, it's hard to pick that up on the fly. Um, but I don't think the, the specific university necessarily matters. It's as like, as with everything in, the, in life, it depends on you, not, not the environment around you, right? And you, you can rise, rise to whatever challenge your environment gives you. Um, but I, what I do think matters is experience uh, and and just get experience any way you can, right? So I think interning, you know, even if they, even unpaid internships, I think are actually tremendously valuable, right? Just getting some actual practical experience in how to make a thing. If you're an engineer, engineers build, right? That's that's what I keep telling my team. If you're an engineer, get experience building. It, get work in your garage and build stuff, Take, learn how to service your car, right? Just figure out how stuff works. Um, and then, you know, that'll give you a foundation to build on. When we hire people, um, you know, one of, one of my kind of laws, um, I've got all these rules I've developed over the course of my career, but one of them is um, I really don't care about the resume. I care an awful lot about cleverness and energy, right? Like, you know, uh, so to me, um, you know, I, I said here, the scout law elements uh, that I love all the scout law, but I find trustworthy is just absolutely critical to me. Find people that you can depend on uh, and that, you know, will, will do their best to get to get the job done. Kind, right? Treat people well and find and only associate, you know, if you're going to bring a team on, bring on people who are kind and then brave. Product development requires bravery. And, you know, you, you have to be able to, to trust in yourself and, and try stuff that has never been done before. And. Uh, without bravery you're just not going anywhere all right thank you very much um we we were talking before we even started recording and i and i forgot to ask um how has the covid uh pandemic oh. affected all of uh, your production or, or work in general because i i so, can only imagine <laughs> yeah um i mean as, as you can imagine um for our business for smith and nephew's business um you know they just released the results of the for, first quarter and they weren't great um and it's because you know, particularly for, for most of what we do, sports medicine um, and things like that, those are elective surgeries. Like your knee hurts and you want, you want to get it replaced, but you can kind of wait a little if you needed to. And right now, as you would expect, everyone's waiting a little, right? <laughs> uh, all over the world. So that's a little tricky. Um, 
So, and what it's, and for what my team does, you know, we're building these big robotic systems and putting them in our factories and, uh, and the company really doesn't want to risk, uh, the, the most important thing to us is, is our employees. And so we don't want extra people in the factories right now, uh, other than the people who are actually making the product. So a lot of our projects have been put on hold because of that. Um, on the flip side, what's interesting is I actually just sent, um, my boss's boss, the head of all manufacturing, um, an article that was in The Economist. Um, in China, in, where the virus started, uh, there are a lot of chip manufacturers in Wuhan, particularly, and they kept running throughout the entire um, throughout the entire pandemic. And it's because chip manufacturing is really automated. There's tons of robots and vision because humans can't do it, right? It's too small. And so one of the big lessons of the pandemic has really been um, automation can actually get you through um, situations where you might not have people or you can't have as many people in a, in a single place. And so um, I never think that, I, I've never really been in a place where, where people talk about automation replacing people. It almost never does that. It, it, it almost always escalates them, elevates people to do much, much more interesting things um, and or takes them away from an unsafe situation. Uh, I think now, as we get into this new normal where we need more space in the workspace and, and you need, you know, your, the people that you have there to be able to do more complex things, it's going to, it's really going to drive more automation. That's amazing. Well, thank you very much. We're coming up on uh, the end of our time. Any last words of wisdom for all of us out here in TV land? <laughs> <laughs> I have not, uh, only what I, what I say, uh, when I sign up as a Scoutmaster, which is until next time, be prepared. All right. Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This is Seraph. And uh, thank you so much for coming out. Really Thanks appreciate so much it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.